Welcome to Somnambulism, When Dreams Come True. Thank you all for coming to the Museum of the Moving Image. Today's program is part of our ongoing Science on Screen series in which we've explored everything from seahorses to androids, bringing scientists and filmmakers to the museum. Science on Screen is a nationwide initiative of the Coolidge Corner Theater Foundation supported by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. 57 nonprofit cinemas from uh, across the country have also received grants to pair scientists with films, and I am proud to say that we are the first museum to receive this grant. The Alfred P. Sloan Foundation is a nonprofit philanthropy founded in 1934, which makes grants in research and broad based education in science, technology, and economics. Its program supporting the arts, which supports film, theater, radio, television, books, and new media, is run by uh, Sloan's Vice President of Programs, Doran Weber. My name is Sonia Epstein. I'm executive editor of our website, Sloan Science and Film, and I am very excited to present to you the 1920 silent film, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Today, uh, the film will not be silent because we are very lucky that uh, we're gonna have a live improvised score performed by Will Epstein of High Water and Elliot Krimsky. In the film, one of the main characters is a somnambulist or a sleepwalker, so I urge you all to stick around after the screening because we have Dr. Carl Bazil here with us who is a parasomnia or sleep disorder specialist. Um, at, the, uh, at Columbia University, he is the director of the Epilepsy and Sleep Division section of the Department of Neurology. The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, as you will see in a moment, is a masterpiece of expressionist filmmaking. The film was originally shot on nitrate film and then tinted. When the film was uh, transferred to acetate-based film, uh, film in other words that wasn't flammable, the original colors were lost. So actually what we'll see today is a restoration um, with the original colors, which were done based on the two uh, surviving nitrate prints of the film. So, um, and I just wanted to mention we were supposed to have a third guest uh, with us. Unfortunately, there was an unforeseen medical emergency, um, but it's gonna be a great program. And um, yeah, I hope you enjoy, and I will see you afterwards. So Carl. <laughs> Um, to get right to sleepwalking, uh, many people believe that when somebody is sleepwalking, he or she is acting out uh, maybe a dream that they're having, or you know, perhaps more psychologically speaking, some sort of suppressed desire. Uh, so I wonder whether either of those is accurate. Well, it's, it's actually a little more complicated than that. <laughs> uh, what, uh, what happened in the film isn't, it doesn't seem to me so much like sleep disorders. Um, but I can see where that came from. So let, maybe I can start talking about what sleepwalking actually is. It's, um, it's a confusional state and it's extremely common. Kids do it all the time. Uh, and sometimes it persists into being awake, but you know, the general principle is you can do automatic things. You're, you're, you have some consciousness. You can walk around a little bit. You can, um, some people actually eat when they're sleepwalking. They might eat weird things, but it's, you can do automatic things. And then usually you just go back to bed. There are things that can, that can bring that out, and I don't know if that's a whole different tangent. But the other thing you were alluding to is acting out your dreams, which is actually a completely different and real sleep disorder, which is fascinating. Uh, that's called REM behavior disorder, which is not what was, what was going on here either. Um, REM behavior disorder, you know, usually when you're dreaming, the, the more active dream states, your body's actually paralyzed. There's mechanisms that do that. You might twitch a little bit, you can move your eyes, that's why they call it rapid eye movement. Um, but you're normally paralyzed. For various reasons, some people are not, and they can actually get up, and they, they still are dreaming. They, dream that they're being attacked by a cat, for instance. I heard that one a couple weeks ago. Or that they're being attacked by somebody, so they'll like, start swinging, they might hurt their bed partner, so it comes to attention through that sort of thing. But it's usually pretty limited, and you, you, you only act out the dream that's happening. You can't, as far as we know, have somebody inject a dream into you that you then act out. So they can't control you. 
is what you're well, saying. the control is is <laughs> it's a whole different tangent, which is fascinating. I think you know, and I'm not really up on my historical medical knowledge right now, but I think at the time uh, hypnosis was becoming used and 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 understood, and many people even today confuse a hypnotic state with a dream state, and they're they're completely different, but that's where the taking over of somebody, that, that idea comes out. And people think that's what hypnosis is even now. Probably a lot of you do. You know, we've been to circus performances where this guy gets up there and they hypnotize somebody and make them bark like a dog. Um, but there, hypnosis exists. It's actually a medical technique which, is, which can be very useful, but it's the reverse of that. The person who is hypnotizing you is actually teaching you to control yourself. And that's why it's used for you know, things like smoking, for instance. Um, so, back to what you were saying about people um, being able to perform automatic sorts of functions while they're sleeping. I'm curious about how people know whether they've sleepwalked, you know, because obviously that's more in like the automated, mechanized, you know, how do they report on that? And then what is the um, interaction between like what happens during sleepwalking and memory? Like, can you ever remember those? Is it sleepwalking, you usually do not. Um, as opposed to the run behavior disorder. But sleepwalking, you're actually in a very deep state of sleep. So your memory is not really functioning. And people often don't know they've done it. They, they find themselves, in fact, this just happened to me this week. This woman came in because you know, she'd been sleepwalking all her life, getting up, doing things, didn't really worry about it too much until she suddenly found herself outside at night trying to get into her car. She woke up and she's like, how did I get here? So she had no memory, and this is typical of how that happened. Usually, you know, usually it's not anything major. Like I said, people might get up out of the bed, walk around the room, go back to bed, go to sleep. They don't know what's even happened unless somebody tells them. Um, and so uh, this film was made in 1920. Um, I think it's interesting that uh, the interpretation of dreams, um, Freud's interpretation of dreams was published in 1900. Um, and I think uh, because of that, it's fair to say that there was this sort of pervasive cultural interest in the unconscious at the time. Um, and so, you know, Caligari is playing this deranged psychiatrist. And for me, uh, you know, one of the creepiest things that happens in the film is at the end where there's this sort of flip between who is the patient and who is the doctor. So I'm curious for you watching this as a doctor, uh, you know, if what your thoughts are and um, maybe about the doctor-patient relationship, the psychiatric institution, you know. Oh, the doctor's the one that's always right. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is, it, it is a big flip and, you know, I, I'm not a psychiatrist, but, you know, we have to, we, you know, I run into a fair number of psychiatric conditions just being a neurologist and it does become almost academic sometimes what is abnormal behavior and what is normal behavior. And obviously, if you're, if you're getting up or if you, if you believe that, that someone is, it, that you're taking control of somebody and making them murder somebody, that doesn't seem like normal behavior. Um, but it, it gets, it, it's, it's actually very complicated what, this, what process goes through this film. You know, and, and what is, so um, what is the role of the psychiatrist in, in treating someone and how might that psychiatrist turn that around? You know, is it possible for a psychiatrist to take control of you, to con take control of someone? And I think that's probably something that people worried about even now and, and probably when psychiatry itself was more in its infancy, which was around this time, yeah, that would be a worrisome thing. So here you are, you're, you're supposed to bear your soul to this person, and they're going to tell you how to change your behavior. That's what a psychiatrist is, uh, or, or how to control your behavior. Well, what if they then take that in a, in a bad way? And you know, conceptually, that's, that's an interesting concept. In reality, it, it's not so simple. I mean, I'm, I'm not aware of a psychiatrist turning someone into a murderer. <laughs> maybe it's never been described. I don't, maybe it's happened and I never, it was never reported. I don't know. I hope not. Um, so, um, 
speaking of hypnosis and psychiatry, um, maybe you can talk a little bit about what the pharmacological treatments are for sleepwalking specifically, um, and also if you've ever seen any uh, alternate treatments such as hypnosis help in that instance. Well, I, I, again, hypnosis is, is, is very interesting. Um, hypnosis has actually been used as a treatment for sleepwalking. Uh, I've referred a couple of patients for it, and it's not clear how it works. It's, um, it, it's changing your, your sleep state to, I guess, a less agitated one or something. Some, you know, we don't know why people will wake up, or, or not wake up, why they will get up during sleep state and, and walk around. But it is known that it can sometimes be induced by a noise or something, that you, you get a partial arousal, and then rather than just kind of lightly waking up and going back to sleep, you lightly half wake up and then do something. So hypnosis had been used for a treatment for that, which seems kind of interesting. Um, what was the other part of your question? Just about what, the, what the pharmacological Oh, the pharmacological. So in, in terms of, uh, there are things that will cause people to sleepwalk. Probably most of you have heard of stories about a drug called Ambien, where people sleepwalk. They, they do weird things in their sleep. And that's probably, that may happen for a number of reasons, but the bottom line is it induces a half asleep state. So when, when this has commonly happened, it is people, when I see it most commonly anyway, it's people who take their drug and they don't go to bed. So they kind of fall into this half asleep state where they're walking around, they might be writing emails that they regret later, uh, they might be driving a car, God forbid, and you know, I've, there are a couple of stories about that. Um, alcohol can induce sleepwalking, or it can be a factor because it, it, it it can deepen your sleep, but also disrupt it in, in some ways. In terms of a pharmacological treatment, usually there isn't one. Usually um, sleepwalking is a little weird, um, but not dangerous, with the exception that I just alluded to. If someone is getting to the point where they're getting out of their dwelling and going outside, you know, potentially in the middle of the winter, and they haven't dressed properly, they lock themselves outside, that's a problem. So you can weirdly treat it, the most common treatment, I say weirdly, is a drug that induces sleep. Uh, it's called clonopin or clonazepam. And that's really the only f pharmacological treatment that's been used for it. What is it called? Clonazepam. It's, it's like, a, it's in the Valium family. And you know, I, I, there's a number of weird things about why that might work. One is that that family of drugs can actually induce sleepwalking. But for various reasons, it also seems to calm it down. But we almost never do that. Um, we take other measures to try and improve the sleepwalking. Um, OK, so I'm, I'm curious if anybody in the audience has any questions. I want you to follow up about the um, medications, because so much of the population are older. And sleeplessness is a, is a national disorder. And you know we're all hooked on Ambien, which is, creates you know, problems when you're, you know, unconscious and, you know, doing, do you don't remember what you did. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, one of the things that sets, you know, there, there are a number of sleeping agents, and when I treat people for sleeping problems, that's almost the last resort. I mean, what usually works the best is what people don't want to do, and that is really working on their sleep habits, working on their sleep structure, learning to shut down, learning things like, Self-hypnosis, for instance, I've used that for sleep disorders. But uh, meditation, yoga, things that will help you to shut down properly and restore the normal sleep process. Um, but Ambien, I think it's, got a, uh, it's gotten a lot more attention for a couple of reasons. One, it's just so widely used that it's, if you're going to have a problem, that's a drug that's more, more often associated with it. But also, it seems to be more of an amnestic, meaning it, it's more likely to cause you not to remember what you did than some of the other agents. So I, I think that there are people who may use a drug like that in the short term, but I completely agree that it's overused. I think you were pretty happy. Yeah. Um, so why is like clonazepam specifically um, might be helpful for this disorder rather than let's say a shorter half-life benzodiazepine? You know, I have no idea. And, I've <laughs> and it is very strange. Um, 
what, what, he, what, was, what he's pointing out is that clonazepam actually lasts a very long time. And one of the reasons we don't like it in general in sleep medicine is you take it at night, but it's still around all the next day. And so it can make people drowsy. But usually for sleepwalking, it's such a tiny dose that that doesn't seem to matter. But yeah, I don't know why that particular member of the family of benzodiazepines, which there, there are you know, half a dozen that are in common usage, and there's probably, and there's another like 10 of them. Why that one seems to work and other ones don't, I don't, I don't know. And also, what about like um, Zyren? I've heard of that that one's used for narcolepsy, so like, you know. Zyren is um, gamma hydroxybutyrate. Uh, many of you think you don't know it, but might, because it's called GHB when it's sold on the streets, or simply G. And it was colloquially known as the date rape drug because it induces a very deep sleep, especially when you mix it with alcohol. Now, it is a pro an approved drug for the treatment of narcolepsy, and not to get too much onto a tangent, why would it work for narcolepsy, which is you know, a, a state of sudden sleepiness? Well, the other thing about people who have narcolepsy is their nighttime sleep is very disrupted, or it often is. So just like they're falling asleep very easily during the day, they're waking up a lot during the night, and something about you know, getting them into a much deeper sleep overnight with this drug, Zyram, or sodium, sodium oxabate, is, can help some people. But you know, it's not one that I like to prescribe for a number of reasons, unless nothing else works. Yeah, in the back on the left. Um, I was wondering, from a contemporary uh, neurological standpoint, how do you currently define the, like, the border or boundary between conscious and unconscious? And how do things like sleepwalking, <laughs> hypnosis, and fever dreams fit in there or complicate it? Wow. Now, if I could answer that question. <laughs> um, Modern neuroscience. Yeah. So I think consciousness is fascinating, but you have to start with the fact that nobody can actually define what it is. Um, because, and, and there's lots of ways, you, you might think, well, that's, that's an easy question. It's, it's actually a very complicated question. What is consciousness? And, you know, dreams are an example. So when you're dreaming, uh, you remember that. You, your brain is active during that state, but you're not considered conscious because most of us feel like conscious means you can interpret what's coming in and react to it going out. And, you know, that might be the, the starting point as to what consciousness is. And then if you start looking at any of these individual states, um, sleepwalking, okay, so that's most of, most of neurologists would consider that an altered state of consciousness. You're not really conscious because you're not interpreting things in a way that somebody's fully awake would, but you're also not unconscious. Uh, you can be awoken from that, and you're also, you're also taking some cues in. You know, you're not walking into the walls, for instance, so the visual cues are getting in. Uh, there's a lot of very murky areas between consciousness and unconsciousness that are absolutely fascinating from a neurological perspective. I'm, I'm going to try not to like go on and on because there may be other questions, but we, we could go into that more if you're interested. Yeah, so we have time for one or two more. Um, yeah, on the right there in the green shirt. Um, what are the differences between sleep and general anesthesia? Ah, well that is a primary example of consciousness versus unconsciousness. And the easiest way to explain it is sleep is actually a very active state. Your brain, you know, it, it, there are different stages of sleep, which most of you are probably aware of. REM sleep uh, or dream sleep, your brain is very, very active. If you look at the neurophysiology, your brain looks much more like it's awake than it is asleep. Uh, and then there is the other ex extreme, which is slow wave sleep. That's where most of these, the sleepwalking happens, where your brain patterns are very different. If you look at somebody in general anesthesia, those patterns don't happen. They're just out. Um, and depending on how deep the anesthesia is, you might even not be able to record uh, normal brain activity at all during that state. So that's, you know, on the conscious, unconscious spectrum, that's probably way on the, in the unconscious uh, realm. Uh, yeah, right there in the middle. The film um, is sort of a prime example of this sort of deleterious user effects of synambulism. There's like a lot of Eastern traditions and yogic traditions of using sort of psychic sleep or yogic nidra 
as a therapeutic tool. I was wondering if you're, and it seems like the APA is sort of starting to catch up with sort of this lucid dreaming where you wake up and then you have some control on it as a therapeutic model. I was curious if you have any experience or ideas with that? Or? Um, well, l lucid dreaming is, is another fascinating concept. For, for those of you, uh, in case you couldn't hear that, lucid dreams are basically you're conscious during a dream. You're aware that you're dreaming, and to some extent you can control it. And that's not an uncommon phenomenon. Uh, as you alluded to, there are some, some people that are, that are trying to train people to do lucid dreaming and, and possibly use that as a therapeutic tool. For instance, you know, I, I don't do this sort of thing, but say you're having uh, recurrent nightmares or you're having a recurrent nightmare that is bringing out what's obviously a conflict in your life. Well, conceptually, you, if, you, if you were able to dream lucidly, you could turn that around. Again, what's conscious, one's, what's <coughs> unconscious. But you're aware of what you're doing. You're aware that you're in a dream state, but you're getting control back. And I think that could be a, a very fascinating therapeutic tool. And I guess the other, the other thing I was, I was um, thinking about is you know, these techniques, meditation, yoga, hypnosis, I think they're all variations on a theme. There, there's some other ones, biofeedback, for instance. Um, but what, what they're teaching is uh, ways of controlling your relaxation, which is so important when you, when you talk about sleep. So I send people for all that stuff. Most of them won't do it. It's too much work. Give me an Ambien. No, I'm not giving you an Ambien. <laughs> uh, but therapeutically, I think it's an incredibly important. Yeah, Andre? So in regards to consciousness, is, uh, are uh, sleep disorders detected or detectable in other species? Ah, mm -hmm. we're getting back to consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, so I can tell you that my dog has some degree of REM behavior disorder, which is not <laughs> uncommon. And many of you, and it, it's not really a disorder, but uh, if any of you have a dog, you may notice that they move a lot in their dreams. So they're not paralyzed the way we are. If that were a person and it were an extreme, that would be run behavior disorder. So, and, and, but one of the problems with you know, trying to figure out whether uh, another species has a quote unquote disorder is we can't talk to them. So a lot of this, yeah, maybe we will one day, uh, but a lot of these things, you know, nightmare disorder, uh, well, actually, uh, there's another one that I know of that is not uncommon, is that I've heard a lot of people say their cats sleepwalk, that they uh, actually get up and move around, in their, in their, and they're clearly asleep. So I guess that's a long-winded way of saying, well, there are a couple examples where we're pretty sure that animals have s sleep disorders, but that's not surprising because virtually all animals go through the same sort of sleep stages that we do. So it's not surprising that they might also develop abnormalities related to that. Okay, um, we have to wrap up, but uh, I just wanna say thank you again to High Water, Will Epstein and Elliot Krimsky, to Carl Bazil for coming. <laughs>And um, just quickly, in case you're interested, um, on May 31st, the actress Ellen Burstyn will be here talking about her friend Buckminster Fuller, who was an ingenious inventor. Um, that will be following a screening of a new film called The House of Tomorrow, which we are collaborating with the World Science Festival to present. So come back if you can. And um, right now, across the street to Cuba, which is a Mexican restaurant, has a happy hour, so I invite you all to calm your nerves, you know, come get a drink and continue the conversation. Um, so thank you all for coming and please check out scienceandfilm.org.